We started this series of messages last week. I shared with you about three months ago, I just had this stirring in my spirit, always thinking ahead. I taught you about that. One of the jobs of a pastor is to think ahead. I was taught when I was very young that that's a lonely place to be. It's kind of lonely sometimes when you have to be the one that goes before everybody else. And I'm constantly thinking out six months even in advance, where should I go? Praying about that often. And God put on my heart to do something totally different before that, but God put on my heart way before the things we see going on in the world, going on especially in Israel, happened. God put on my heart that we needed to go to this passage of Scripture. Most of you don't know this, but on Wednesday nights we have church. We have Wednesday night church. I'm just kidding. We do. And we have a lot going on on Wednesday nights. But one of the things I do is I teach a Bible study in the cafe. We're kind of outgrowing that room, so I don't know what we're going to do next. We'll figure that out, but it's a good problem to have. But we go verse by verse through the Scriptures. We've covered at least 19 books of the New Testament, uh, cover to cover. There's only 26 of them. We're just kind of pressing on with that. But we just go verse by verse. And so for the next, I mean, couple of months most likely, we're going to do a lot of that in this because we have one passage of Scripture and we're going to pick it completely apart. This is not a cursory study of this. We're going to go to this. And so it just starts with Jesus is walking out of the temple one day. And imagine the most impressive thing you've ever seen in your life, some impressive building or what it may be. I saw the Brooklyn Bridge, for example, when I was a little bit younger, and I watched a documentary about that. And I'm not a city boy at all. I love the country. And, and so to see that with my own eyes and see the story behind that, I mean, it's one of those markers in my life. The Statue of Liberty, I got to go to the top of the Statue of Liberty, those kinds of things. I've been to Washington, D.C. one time. And one time was enough. Can I get an amen from the congregation? I'm good. Yeah, I can have that place. But anyway, I've seen some things that were impressive to me because I just maybe had seen them on TV, but I got to see them with my own eyes. And the most impressive place, most likely, that was on the planet during those days was this amazing temple. And they say, Jesus, look at this temple. And he says, don't you even understand? There's coming a day when not even one stone will be left upon the other. And so they ask a really good question, a great question. When is that going to happen? How can we know when that will happen? How can we know how this is all going to end up, basically, they ask. And so Jesus just answers their question. It's really important to make sure you hear this. I I, I really want to make sure you understand this. God created communication. I don't believe half the books I've ever seen out there that talk about there's codes and this and that, whatever in the Bible. And if you wink three times and look at it upside down, it'll say this. I don't, that's a bunch of hogwash. He created communication. He wants you to understand his word. He doesn't want to make it weird. It doesn't have to be that way at all. Jesus is answering this question to some average people just like you and just like me. There was not a seminary graduate in the bunch. And so he had answered the question in ways they could understand and they could communicate to others. And he does the same for us. The Bible has a direct reference in every point, but it has an indirect reference also. These words were spoken to these particular disciples, but amazingly, a couple thousand years later, we're looking at these and it's a direct reference for us as well. And so he starts answering the question. The first thing he talked about last week, we talked about this, I will not re-preach that sermon, was birth pangs. What happens? If you've ever been around a, a pregnant woman, I've done that a few times in my life. It's amazing how it starts off with some basic pains and some little side this, whatever, and it increases with intensity as it goes along and frequency as it goes along. And he said, there's some things that are going to occur in this world with greater frequency And certainly with more intensity as time rolls on. And I'll I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. But he talked about some of those things. You know, wars, rumors of wars, and famines, and all those things. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Following that time, obviously, he talks about something today that is really, let's just be honest with you. Without knowing Jesus, it would be a scary thing and a scary proposition to look at. This whole idea of what we're going to look at this morning. And let me read for you, beginning in verse 15 this morning. We're going to look at these words today. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever, it says, is on the housetop must not go down to the house, it says, and get those things that are theirs. And verse 18 says, whoever's in the field must not turn back to go get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies during those days. But I pray for your flight will not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Don't miss that. Unless those days have been cut short, no life would have been saved. 
But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I've told you in advance. So if they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Or, Behold, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. And then these sobering words. Whenever the corpse or wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. God, these are your words. I've studied them as much as I know how to study them, but that's not enough. We're not smart enough, God. We don't have the ability to understand these words without your help. And as I often say to you, I'm not even going to try to do that this morning. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try to hide behind you. I would ask God that your Holy Spirit would have freedom in this room today to teach us some difficult things to study some hard things to understand. But God, your Holy Spirit can illuminate those things to our hearts and even give us the ability to understand them and apply them to our hearts and lives. Teach us today, God. You be the preacher. You be the teacher. You be the God. That's our prayer, and we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. There's a passage of Scripture in Luke chapter 21, verse 20, that says this. It's just a description of what we see here. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is at hand. I told you I won't re-preach last week's message, but I can tell you that every one of the birth pangs that we talked about last week are, are occurring and have occurred and continue to occur in this world. Did you hear that verse of Scripture? <laughs> is the newspaper coming alive? Is the news that you see in the evening coming alive? Luke chapter 21, verse 20, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is at hand. People ask me often, do you think we could be living in the latter days and last days? And I say, absolutely, I believe that. Could Jesus come today? Absolutely, he could. And so we need to understand the Bible more than any time in my life. I've only been alive since since 1963. But in those years, I've never seen the Bible coming alive like it is today. Oh, there's been markers and points, but not like this. And you have to be honest about it. Not like this. And so this place, Israel, did you know that Israel's only about 250, some would say 275 miles long and only 85 miles wide? If you left Chattanooga, Tennessee, driving to Knoxville, Tennessee, you would cross the entire nation in that short drive. It's the size of the state of New Jersey in the United States, this place. And yet God has made it the focal point of all of, all of history. Think about it. A.D. 70, we see the, dest- the destruction completely of the temple. From 1933 to 1945, Hitler tries to extinguish the Jewish race completely. Can you imagine that? Formed again as a nation, and daily we see in the news what we see often, it's still the hot point of all of eternity, and always will be. I want you to think about this for a minute. Literally, if you were to take a pin and stick it in a globe, that spot that that pin made is where God has brought all of human history together. How could you not believe the Bible to be true? How could you not believe the Bible to be coming alive when you see these things happening in this tiny little place? How can we not look past this idea that we see that 800 years even before Jesus was born, we were told he'd be born in this obscure little tiny little place. Here's what it would look like in the society. Here's how he'd be born of a virgin. Here's how he would live. Here's how he'd minister. Here's, here's how he would die. And yes, even how he'd be resurrected and not believe the Bible to be true. Because it happened exactly the way b- the Bible said it would. And so this obscure little tiny place, 270 miles maybe long, 85 miles wide, is the place that is surrounded, listen to me, surrounded by enemies. That verse of Scripture said, when you see it surrounded by armies, this day may be coming. You think about it, when you look at this place, this little tiny place that's surrounded by Iraq, Iran, Russia, Syria, Egypt, and Jordan, none of which want to be their friend. And let me say this before I go any further. The day the United States chooses not to back Israel will be the day its funeral begins. I believe that with all of my heart. 
I believe that with all of my heart. God has had mercy and grace on this nation way beyond anything we would ever deserve. And I think a lot of it is tied to the fact that we've always been an ally of this tiny little obscure place that's at the heart of God. May it always be. And when you ever hear someone that won't back that, run away from them. Don't be their friend. You don't want to be their friend. And so this amazing topic comes out. I'm going to talk more about that as we go through this. But the second coming of Jesus is going to happen, but there's some things that are going to happen before that. And so I thought about this. When you talk about subjects like this, and there may be people in this room this morning that it's, it's affecting you this way, no one goes away from a study of a subject like this unscathed. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, I would think that you would be fearful. You'd be kind of weird if you weren't fearful to think that these things we're going to study today are going to take place. And I'm fixing to share with you some things that are really difficult. Did I say just fixing? And we're fixing to... to I just said that, didn't I? And y'all appreciate it. I know you do. <laughs> it's all good. For those out in internet land, fixing means fixing, okay? Anyway. We're going to study some very difficult things to look at. If you didn't hear the text a moment ago, as bad as anything has ever been in this world, think of the horrible things that have taken place on planet Earth since Jesus even walked on this earth. Think about it. It's going to be worse. It's going to be far worse. And so I've always said this to people, you know what, if, you're, if you love Jesus with all of your heart and he's your Lord and your Savior, I have incredible news for you. No matter how bad this world gets, this is the worst it's ever going to be for you. But if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior this morning, I got incredibly bad news for you. This world and the chaos that's in it and the difficulty that's in it and the harshness of it, this is the best it's ever going to be for you because it's only going to get worse. So we're going to talk about this. Let's dive into this text this morning and learn from this outline that God put on my heart. Number one, notice the response. Notice the response. We said in verse 15 these words, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then, it says, those who are in Judea, it says, must flee to the mountains Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things that are in their house. He says, whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that the flight will not be in winter or on a Sabbath. Now, step one we talked about last week. The first thing that we need, I, I don't think I have to spend a lot of time convincing you that step one of what we talked about is taking place. This is not something that's going to take place. Birth pains, again, are the pains that a, a woman has when she's going to have a baby. It's not just yet the time, but as they increase in frequency, and again, the idea they get more difficult, that's when you pay attention. Those birth pains, again, false messiahs. We know that's been taking place since Jesus was here. Wars, rumors of wars, increase in famines. It broke my heart last week to share with you that a third of the people on this planet are starving to death as we speak right now. And sadly, almost a third of the children in the United States today go to bed hungry every night, which is sad even to think about. Natural disasters, we see them getting more frequent. I talked to you last week. I don't think that's controlled by a man. I think it's controlled by God. He said it was. Violence against followers of Christ. The average year in the world, no one talks about this. They don't cover this on Fox News at night. The average year for like the last 30 years, about 100,000 people on this planet have died because of their faith in Christ. Never will get covered on the news. All let's make sure we cover those spotted owls and those bald eagles. Don't cut that redwood tree down. It's sacred. Over 100,000 people every year somewhere on this planet killed just because of their faith in Christ. False worship will arise. False teachers will arise. We know that's happening. And then a falling away from the faith I share with you recently for the last 30 years has been a trend in the United States of walking away from faithfulness to the church and faithfulness to serve Jesus through his church, which is not God's will. That's step one. Do I really have to spend a lot of time there saying, aren't we there? Are we there yet? Yes, we're there. 
Number two, step two, he says there's going to be a day when the Antichrist is going to come and set his throne up in this temple. He's going to desecrate the temple. We don't know exactly what that is, but he's going to blaspheme the Holy Spirit in the most holy and sacred place on this planet. He's going to, he's going to require that the whole world worship him as God. He's going to set his throne up in a place where he does not belong. And one day God's going to come and remind him of that, but at that point... There's a day the Antichrist is going to come, and it will be easy to understand when that happens. And he says, you need to sit up and take note. Now, a couple things to help you understand, and maybe some background behind that. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 11, it says this period of time will be 1,290 days. That's exactly three years and seven months. The Antichrist is going to come. He's going to rise to this throne. He's going to desecrate the temple. At that point, sets a timer. 1,290 days will start that day the first part of the tribulation, and it's not going to be pretty. Now listen, no one's going to be safe. If you're a believer during that time, we'll have a whole other debate maybe starting next week about Jesus' second coming. When do you think that's going to happen? Is there going to be a rapture? Is there not a rapture? We'll talk about that, I promise. We'll get there. Hang with me. We'll get there. But if there's a believer on planet Earth, when that clock starts, the last place you will want to be on this planet is in Jerusalem. Did you hear me? You know, if, if chaos happens in the whole world, the last place I want to be is in a big city. Can I get a name? I don't want to be in a big city. Man, I moved to Meigs County, and I'm proud of it. <laughs> in fact, if you look on Google search, it, I might only think it'll even lead you to my house. So you have to ask me if you want to come see me, because I don't think Google even gets you. It gets you in the neighborhood, but not close. I, I kind of like that. The last place you want to be on this planet when the Antichrist steps up and declares himself God, is in Jerusalem. And the last person you want to be is a Jewish believer in Jerusalem. So Jesus is writing, and he's, he's, again, he's speaking to these disciples, and he says, if you see that happen, as a Jewish believer, flee. Don't pray about it. Don't get your stuff together. Years ago, I got to tell a quick story. This is the funniest story of my life. I had a guy in my church that I was there for six and a half years. I must have visited this guy in the hospital. I'm not kidding you, 50 times in those six years. He was always sick. He could never walk. He was always in a wheelchair. He was always a person that was just like, you know, laying around. He was always in the hospital. I never, ever saw the man never take a step. But I just figured that he couldn't. Well, one day I get a phone call from the, 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 what, was the, what we call Cleveland Utilities. In this town, it's called Tri-State Electric up in, in the Blue Ridge, Georgia area. I get this call from, they say, such and such house, I know they're a member of your church, their house is on fire. And so I, it's snowing outside. It was a really weird day. And so I get in the car and I drive up there and I pull in. And unbeknownst to me, I could not believe this. My eyes, I had to rub my eyes. This man that for six years, I've never seen him either in a bed or he's in a wheelchair. I never saw him take a step, ever. Running in and out of his house, carrying his guns and laying them in the yard and running back inside, I've never seen him. I was like, man, that guy's been pulling the wool over his wife's eyes for all these years. You know, it was a house fire. And it, while we're there, just so it's fun to tell the story, I go up to the lady, I said, hey, what happened? She said, well, I had a grease fire in the kitchen, so I went out back and grabbed the garden hose. Uh-huh. Thankfully, it was frozen and wouldn't even put water out. But unthankfully, she had no way to put it out, so it burned the house down. And here, just a tidbit while we're there, I, my dissertation that I paid $60 per copy to have bound was in her house, and it burned up with her house. But anyway, all that to say, here's a guy I've never seen even take a step, running, running in and out of his house. Listen to me. When this day comes, flee. Don't go back and get your stuff. Well, how am I going to make it without my stuff or my contact lenses? Or why am I going to make it without my makeup? Listen, leave it and run. I'll give you more information about that in just a minute. But he says this again, verse 16, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. We've read this twice already, but whoever's on the housetop, don't go down and get your stuff. If you're out in the field, don't go back and get your cloak. But woe to those that are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. That's a sad thing to even think about, isn't it? But pray that your flight will not be in winter or on a Sabbath. Well, the response is to flee, right? <laughs> When you think about what's going on in those days, that's, again, these three years and seven months. That's going to be a very difficult time. There's a passage of Scripture in Zechariah 
It's sad to read this. In Zechariah ch chapter 13, verses 8 and 9, it says that, listen to this carefully, millions of Jews will not safely make this journey. Millions will be fleeing. But the scriptures teach in the book of Revelation that only a remnant will safely get away. We see Hamas beheading people. We go, that's horrible. We see a picture in the scriptures right here of mass, mass chaos, of mowing millions of people down for one reason. Yeah. How could it be worse than some of the things I've heard about in human? Can you imagine this? And all done with glee, and all done by those that don't believe in a way that they would think is perfectly okay. Millions won't make it. Women, children, boys, girls, adults. What we have seen in Israel in these last few days is a microcosm of what's going to occur. And I don't know about you, but it hurts my heart to see what we're seeing now. Revelation 12, verse 14, by the way, is the text says, a remnant will succeed in escaping to the mountains. When you see this happen, go, flee, don't pray about it, get out of there. And the evil that's in this Antichrist won't even allow millions of those people to get out. What a horrible, horrible thing. He says, here's the response. When you see this happen, go, get out of there. I've told you the story. I remember getting in my truck on 9-11 that morning. I didn't know anything was going on. I drove all the way from First Baptist Church where I was pastor at the time to I was heading to Erlanger Hospital to make a hospital visit. I listen to Christian music in my car most time and most times it's CD. I know it's old school. I'm old. It's okay. I listen to CD music and things like that. Now I got a phone that can help me do things, but that was before those days. I remember walking in the lobby at Erlanger Hospital and seeing all these people gathered around these few TVs that were in the lobby. And I was like, what in the world's going on? And I walked over and I saw the buildings burn. I was like, wow. I didn't know what to do except to go upstairs and make a quick hospital visit. That person didn't need to know what was going on. They were having a surgery. And then I got in my car and took my flip phone out in those days and called my wife, Tracy, and said, where are the girls? They're at school. I said, go get them. Who knew what was going to happen? Nobody knew. But when something like that happens, I bet your first thought's going to be this. Where are my loved ones? And let's get out of here. What a horrible picture that is. What a horrible thing that is to think about millions of people getting mowed down because of their faith. Write this down. Number two, notice the reality. Verse 21. For then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Man, those are some loaded words, aren't they? Unless those days have been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Two things, right now. Number one, the great tribulation. We're going to talk a lot more about this later, so I won't spend a lot of time here. But the words were spoken here. Never been this bad before. And never will be again. Is that enough? I've told you over the years, you don't want to stand before the Lord one day having never read the Bible. Look, just, hey, there's not a scripture verse for this. But I, I, I can imagine the guy walking up. And I'm not saying they're going to do this, but imagine you walk up in heaven and they go, well, I just need one to ask one question. You lived for 78 years. Uh, did you ever get to read the Bible? Well, you know, I was busy. I don't want to be that guy to you. You know, I had stuff to do. I left you a love letter. It had everything you needed to be successful to do anything I ever asked you to do. Everything you needed was in that one that you didn't have time. Okay. You don't want to be on this planet when this happens. 
We'll talk more about that later. The tribulation. Never been this bad before and never will again. Number two, write this down, the great testimony. The great testimony. I love verse 22. It just reminds me of God's grace and mercy. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. In the greatest challenge you've ever faced in your life, in the biggest pit you've ever spent time in, the toughest day you've ever lived, if you will pay attention, there's just the peace of God's grace in all things. It's going to be a really, really tough time, but God loves so much that he'll cut that time short because of his grace and because of his mercy. I don't know where you've been, what you've been through, but I know this. If you're in Christ, you've never walked through it alone. He's always been there. Amen. Sometimes you didn't see it. Sometimes you didn't feel it. But he's always been there. Why? Because he said he would be there. He said, I'll walk through the valley of the shadow of death with you, and you should fear no evil because I'll be with you. And he is with us. And even in the, he says, the worst time ever on planet earth, never ever to be topped. My mercy's there too. Amen. My grace is there too. Amen. Number three, notice the riddle. The riddle. Interesting passage right from verse 23 to verse 27. It says, then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I've told you in advance. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for doing that. So if they say to you, behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. Just as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. This is, again, kind of hard to even look at. The word picture is painted here, these, the remnant that finds them, themselves to safety in the mountains. What's the next step? Well, the Antichrist will have many minions to go and do his bidding. And they'll use anything they can to draw these people out. When I was a, a, a younger father and had younger girls, when I had my three little girls and Faith came along so much later, she had to have her own time with this. But when those two young ones, we used to play hide and seek all the time. Hide, go seek. All right, Daddy, you count. One, two, three. Next thing I know, I'd get to whatever number that was, and I'd go looking for my little girls. And they weren't really good hiders. They thought they were. And, you know, I'd go around the corner, and I'd kind of look in the den, and I'd see one maybe behind the couch, but I'd act like I didn't see them. And I'd just keep walking. Whoa, I wonder where they are. Where are you at? I'm coming. And I just walk out of the room and make the point, well, I guess she's not in the living room. I'll just go look in the kitchen. And it was all a ploy to see if they'd jump out and, and maybe go hide somewhere. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Can you imagine armed forces going out and using anything at their disposal to get these people to peek out so they could kill them? Can you imagine that? And you say, Phil, what, what, what could they possibly use? Well, I suspect when they didn't go back and get their cloak and they didn't have time to go back and get their stuff, they're probably going to be hungry, thirsty, who knows what. Hey, if you'll just come out, we have all this food for you. We have all this water for you. And I don't want to be a conspiracy dude. That's not me. But you do know the U.S. government does that. They'll do anything in their power to take your money and buy you with it. Oh, we'll just forgive all that. I'm so proud of my two oldest daughters. They, they got some debt. We did everything we could do to help them in college, and they built up some debt. They paid every red cent of it back. It's one of the first things they did when they got a job. Well, we'll just forgive all that debt. You know what that is, don't you? We want you to vote for us for the rest of your life. I've met people that say, I'm opposed to abortion, and I'm opposed to this, and I'm opposed to big government. But you know, when I was in need, they gave me a handout. What do you really think COVID was? The riddle. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, God is not the author of confusion. <laughs> 
If it's confusing, it didn't come from him. John 8, verse 44, Satan is the father of lies. And so imagine what will be done. Everything you can imagine will be done to try to draw these people out to kill them. Even this. Jesus is here. If they're students of the Bible, they know that coming sometime down the road, Jesus said, I'm coming back to receive my church to myself, right? We'll talk more about that in the next week, I promise. Can you imagine even using that? Hey, we just heard that Jesus is here. Can you imagine undercover people? My friend, Pastor Mindy, that comes and visits us every year from Gambia, he says he preaches many times in these crusades, and he can look out in the audience, and he can see these people. They're government officials that wear like these solid white shirts. They're easy to pick out, he said. And they're there to observe and to listen to what he preaches about and to see who gives their life to Christ. Could there be moles in the mountains? How evil the Antichrist will be in those who follow him. There's a result, a result. Wherever the corpse is, <laughs> there the vultures will gather. I told you to live out in the country, and out in the country where I live, a lot of animals get hit on the roads and things like that. And from our house, we can look out sometimes and just see the vultures just circling. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you see vultures circling anywhere? Yeah. Something's dead. Something's dead. Jesus paints a picture, perhaps of fields filled with corpses. And the filled day it will be for the vultures. The abomination of desolation, the worst it's ever going to be. The only good news I have for you today is the only good news we ever have is that Jesus has conquered death in the grave. And I'm going to talk more about next week, my theology about the second coming and the rapture and all that good stuff. But here's what I'll say to you. It doesn't really matter. Paul says, for me to live is Christ. But you know what? To die is just gain. If you're in Christ today, it doesn't matter really what happens as we go forward. You're secure in him. Amen. And so my word is this. You don't want to be outside of Christ. As much as I really want you to read the Bible through, please hear this. More important than that. Be secure in him. Amen. I've quoted this verse at least a thousand times in the 20 years you've allowed me to be the pastor of this church. These things I've written unto you who believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Amen. And I don't know much, but I know that. Amen. And that's enough. Amen. God, we... We hurt when we see passages of Scripture like this. God, to even have the thought of millions of believers mowed down by this horrible person that will arise one day. To think of the gall of a man who will stand one day at, in your holy temple and declare himself to be God. The evil that flows through his veins, God, to kill millions of people. Thank you, Lord, that you, you never told us the exact day, you never told us the month, but you told us enough that we could have a clue, perhaps, when these things are going to happen. And Lord, we got to be honest with you, we, we looked last week, everything you talked about to these disciples is going on right now. Could it be? Could it be? That this horrible day is just around the corner. And if that is true, Lord, I know what you would want me to say right now, which is this, get on the ark. <laughs> get in Christ. Don't leave this place today without knowing the full assurance that you're in Christ Jesus. Because my friend, this day will come. You can count on it. Lord, for many of us, 
the, the word that we need today is that if this is true, then we need to be telling people about Jesus. And so many of us, God, are reluctant to do so. We're so worried that somebody's going to think we're a fruit flake or nut because we love Jesus. Well, that's okay. I pray, God, you would give us a new level of boldness and courage to tell our friends and neighbors and even an acquaintance that we meet for the very first time how important it is that they trust Christ as their Lord and Savior. Just as surely as I'm standing here, God, there's coming a day when the Antichrist will stick his ugly head up. And for many, God, at that moment, it's just going to be too late. Give us urgency, God, in giving away the greatest gift we could ever give to anyone. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I don't know what needs to happen right now. I just know this. You're here. You care. And Lord, there's nothing that we're facing, nothing that we're dealing with that's greater than you. So God, please meet us at the point of our need. Give us courage to do what you've called us to do. We'll give you glory in advance because that's what faith we have in you. In Christ's name I pray, amen.